Hey guys, brand new podcast. By the way, I am doing shows this weekend, November 6th and 7th in San Francisco and Burlingame. Then on the 20th in Reno and then the 21st on Reno. And then on the 28th in Escondido, two shows. They've moved that earlier show to six o'clock. If you got tickets for that earlier show, make sure to know, make sure to pay attention that they've moved it uh, a little earlier. My, my show, The Cabin, is streaming right now on Netflix. And today's guest is from The Cabin. He's probably from one of the most talked about episodes uh, that anyone in media has been curious to talk about. And that is the Miss Pat, Kaylee Cuoco. By the way, I wonder if I'm saying Kaylee's name wrong the entire time. Have I been saying her name wrong? <clears throat> Kaylee Cuoco, Joel McHale. <clears throat> it is, it's one of the best episodes. And it's one of the one everyone's talking about. I have, and this is all in the cabin, but I don't share a lot of this. I've known Joel McHale for a long time. We talk about for a brief second. I had a deal at Budweiser to make commercials for Budweiser and they wanted to do, they wanted to pair us up with actors and they paired me up with Joel McHale, who at the time was just doing commercials and he murdered it, murdered it so much that I, I think part of them probably was like, why don't we just give it to this kid? Fuck the fat guy. Anyway, I've known Joel for a long time. His producer um, on the soup is a close friend of mine <clears throat> and, and he was on the cabin. He is an amazing, I don't need to tell you more about Joel McHale. You know, Joel McHale. He's from the soup community. Um, literally, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read his bio because all of a sudden I was like, Jesus Christ, Joel's done fucking everything. What was the movie I was thinking? The Informant. He was in The Informant with, uh, with Matt, Ted, The Big Year, uh, Spy Kids. He's been in everything. Anyway, we have a great conversation. We talk about the career that he's had, um, what the highlights were, what it was like to transition from not making money to making a little money to doing well. And then we talk about, not, we talk about a lot of things. We talk about um, what it was like to work with your heroes, what it was like to have your heroes let you down. Um, and we talk about knives. If you're into knives, man, the last 30 minutes of the podcast, you're going to love. We have a great, 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 great podcast. He's got a great podcast with, uh, with Dr. Ken. Uh, without further ado, I really hope you enjoy this podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend and knife enthusiast, Joel McHale. He's the man. Someone got a haircut. Yeah, I'm in the ROTC. <laughs> oh, look at this. Awesome. You ready, Halston? Yeah. Good deal. Uh, boy, do I have so much I want to talk to you about. Boy, do I have so much I want to talk to you about. Uh, before, I guess we can say on the podcast, your wife is possibly the most lovely person. You did very well. You know, I, you know I've been, you know, when you do press, you find those little stories uh, that, um, like, you know, cause people always want to know about like whatever they're about, about the show. And so I said, but one of the things I've been talking about is press is I text everyone saying Leanne, Leanne is very sweet person. And she made everyone baskets for the cabin so that, uh, to thank everyone for doing it because you guys didn't, you guys literally didn't have to do it. And it was very nice for everyone to participate. And so I said, the best is she goes, Hey, text everyone. And then CC me in that so that I can find out their address. So Bobby Lee writes back, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the name of my street. My house is the one with the yellow door. And you're like, great, awesome. You could give him an address, but good call. Uh, Donald Rollins writes, um, yeah, I'm going to be over at the Chevron on La Brea at 1.30. Can you stop by then? And I go, and Joel McHale, I go, I, I look away from my phone for a second, and all of a sudden they're back texting back and forth pictures of dogs. And like, oh, my God, what a cute puppy. Oh, let me show you my dogs. I go, that is a testament to how charming Joel McHale is. And then I said, my wife goes over there and comes back. She goes, I spent an hour in that house. That is a lovely house. He's got great cars. He is the sweetest guy in the fucking world. I go, it is exactly who you are. Well, she was so uh, disarmingly charming. And then she started telling me about her dad. Oh, yeah. And I like, and then talking about being a car racer, I was like, what the flick? She's like, then my dad took my Porsche away from me because he caught me going 100. And I was like, this is, that is the coolest person ever. And yeah, well, no, uh, you know, I'm a dick to people that are dicks usually. Sometimes I'm way too nice, but she's, uh, you did well. You put up, you put up, you, you do put up a guard though. Like you're, you're amazingly sweet, like really are a genuinely sweet person, but you do put up a guard, I think at times to like, to like keep that away from you. Yeah, uh, 
uh, do, wait, hi, hiding being nice or yeah, hiding? you hide, you hide being nice and like, and like, uh, and almost like a jab kind of way a little bit. Oh yeah. I, well, it's also because I, uh, uh, I like when I would play sports, I would get way too competitive and way too intense. And I have been in arguments where I realized, Oh, you're being that guy. You need to, st- you need to step away. You're being way too, you're, you're, you're too far gone. And I used to do like with sports, I was like a dirty basketball player. So I had to, I had to kind of, kind of like, and and like same thing with road rage. So I'm like, just, you need to take your foot off the gas. So, uh, uh, I've gotten better and by just not playing basketball, it works out great. Uh, That's interesting. I'm very, very similar. I have a problem with competition where I, I kind of lose myself a little bit and I'm embarrassed of it. And so my default was always to, I, in, in college, I quit competitive sports because I was like, I don't have the ability to, um, to just to just be the guy that has fun and competes. I I sh- I shut down a tad bit. Yeah, yeah. Do Do you feel like that has whatever that uh, lack of a better people call it? Oh, it's the warrior gene. I'm like, nah, maybe it's just the asshole gene. But do you think that I feel like that thing compelled us to come down to Los Angeles and go like, I'm going to make it in the big time, you know, like doing all that stuff. I feel like, you know, that that thing, whatever that hair up our ass, that's part of it. That is it. I think it is. I haven't lost it. Like, sadly, and I, I wish I've said things I can I can say it to that. I've said it. To, I've said things that are competitive in this business to like my, to like close friends. And like, and so I'll tell you, I said it's, I've definitely said things that are a bit fucked up to Rogan and he has call, called me on it. And I say that because everyone thinks Rogan's uber competitive and he's genuinely not like he is a, a raise the, raise the C and everyone raises type guy. And mm-hmm. I've said like, I've said like, I don't know, like shitty things about maybe someone special, like that I'm not friends with, but like a person and I've like kind of slid it over to Rogan's way thinking he'll hammer it back to me and he'll be like, Oh, why do you care? Like almost like defensive, not even like, and I'm like, fuck man, is that part of my brain? I was doing it today on the treadmill. We're going to be hundred percent honest. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I wait, feel wait. like there is a competitiveness in my brain that I, that I can't shut off. I want everyone to succeed, but I feel like that only about the good people, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I agree. But, but do you have I, this? I agree. But even <laughs> with good people, which, which uh, I want people to know, because I know you have a lot of, uh, of people to watch this, but everyone goes like Hollywood, jaded, you know, people are awful. And I was like, I'm going to say like 10% are awful. Everyone else is pretty great. And, yeah. uh, and I'm going to say that probably about every single industry. But I interviewed Will Forte because we were in this movie. And that's when Last Man on Earth was coming out. And I realized, I was, like, I was like, hey, Will, I love your show so much. I know I love it because I'm filled with jealousy. I'm filled with envy. And I wish uh, I, I'm, I'm just, it's eating me alive. And he was like, oh, hey, that's how I, that's, that's the exact thing I do. I'm like, oh, right. Yeah, it doesn't stop us yeah. from, from wanting that thing. And want, And it's, I don't know, it, because you know the people are good. It's not, you're like, I'm gonna, I hate them for it. But it's just like that thing where the ultra competitiveness to keep going is always there and i need to, you know you, you see it everywhere but you know that's why we yeah that's why we came down here or came it, over here what's funny because there's like i think i gave up on certain things like i had a real hard time enjoying baseball i had a real hard time enjoying baseball when i was in college and after college and going to a baseball game kind of shut me down because i there's a part of me that thought i should be out there also like I literally was like, cause my, well, the guy, I, I mean, I, anyone that played baseball with me is laughing right, right now, but the guy I caught went on to play, play professional baseball. And so I always thought ultimately had I focused, I could have maybe played, I could, if I had cared, I could have played in college. I just walked off. Like I walked on and then literally first day I walked off and went, I don't want to catch bullpens. I thought if I had that discipline where I caught bullpens, maybe I get an opportunity, maybe I get this, maybe I get that. And so I had to shut down with baseball. And I think I gave up on baseball at a certain age. I gave up. I went, I went and saw my buddy was named Brad Radke. I went and saw him pitch uh, against the Dodgers when I was already in baseball, when I was already in comedy and like kind of successful in comedy. And I couldn't, it was the first game I really enjoyed. 
And I went, oh, yeah, I couldn't be out there, man. Fuck that. Like, I, that was crazy talk. And, and do, you I, think, do you think that's because you had had some success in comedy and you're like, I followed that muse to go do that thing and I'm, and I'm now at peace with it? Uh, or was it because, oh, this is, this is I'm so glad I, 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 it was just not the life for me. Baseball. I think, I think at, at a certain point I started feeling like, I think when I had no calling, when I had no direction, I was like, I, that could have been my calling and maybe I walked away from, from it. Um, and then once I was like, oh, comedy was my thing. That definitely was always been my thing. Then I was like, oh, I can really enjoy baseball. This was, I, and then, and I, I remember looking at people like, uh, I'll, like I'm not going to say exact names, but I remember looking at certain baseball players and going, oh, well, I'm not that guy. That guy's a fucking idiot. Like, he's a meathead. Like, he's the guy that drove me nuts in practice. He was like, Come on, guys. It's all hustle. It's all hustle. Show goes to hustle. And I'm telling you, man, that's how we beat the team. We spread out to our positions and they realize we mean business. And I'm like, oh, that guy's a fucking moron. Like, I was never that guy. And so I think I, I and, and, and when you say Will Forte, I love Will Forte. I love Will Forte. I legit him and uh, him and um, what's the other guy that looks like Will Forte that they always mix up? There was an SNL guy. That was what? There was, oh, uh, geez, who looks like Will Forte. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They were on SNL at the same time. Oh, uh, well, Taron Killam was on the same time. No, 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 no. Uh, Anyway, I love Will Forte. And so I know I couldn't do what Will Forte does. Like his brain is like his, we have very different brains and he commits in a way that I can't commit. At a certain point, I remember hearing, having an agent tell me, uh, I was like, how come I'm not going out for auditions? And he was like, because they're not writing parts called Burt Kreischer. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, you can play Burt Kreischer, and that's it. He was like, I'm not going to lie to you. If it's a if it, if the character is written for you, it's great. But like, you're not going to go in and be Kramer. And I was like, fuck, I'm not going to be Kramer. Like, I can't be any like my version of myself is already so ridiculous that to try to morph it is not going to fit. And that so, is a good freaking agent who recognizes that and like now we need to exploit Burke Kreischer and get that out there. Yeah. And he was like, you gotta be, you're going to have to get famous in like, in like stand up before you do a sitcom. Cause I always wanted to do uh, multi-cams are like, are like, my, that was my, yeah, you, you did the great outdoors was multi-cam, right? Oh, it was the great indoors. See what we did. Indoor. I'm sorry. Great indoors. Uh, oh yeah. No, that was, uh, it was actually four years ago. Uh, we were shooting it four years ago. I guess it's the election, end, but, uh, four years ago this year. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, we, uh, <laughs> they called to tell me it was canceled after the first season and they were like, yeah, it was really close. And I was like, oh, uh, I don't know which is worse closer you know you didn't have a chance but uh yeah, no, that, that life was that life was wonderful i highly recommend the schedule it is tremendous and uh i don't know if sitcoms will ever survive but it's a tremendous thing i, I wish they would go back to how they used to be like with the honeymooners where i mean they, they've been doing it on netflix with um uh what do you call it one day at a time but uh where you just you don't there's no laugh tracks there's no you let you let jokes die if they were if they weren't great. You just you let it be a play. You don't manipulate it, and that's that's what I that's that's what I would like to do. See what I did? Is there is there a way? Like do you? I did. I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. Do you care less once you've had success? Oh, I don't know. Talk to my wife. She would. I, I'm constantly. I constantly think I've just done my last job. Uh, uh, by the way, I think we all, everyone feels like that. Like, I feel like that on everything. I, I, it's the reason I'm touring right now is cause I go, I can't imagine the person that goes just driving down the street going, well, everything's going good. That's it. We did it. Like, I'm like, I'm literally sitting here on my birthday going, what content can I make today? I need to make content. I need to like, I need to create something. I need to do something. And I'm like, today's the election. Shut the fuck up. Get drunk early, pass out, get on the treadmill. That's it. Like, but I cannot sit on my hands. You're on the treadmill after you pass out? No, no, no. I, I like to drink a box of wine on the treadmill. It's my favorite oh, thing that's, to do. Uh, no, I, I, and I think that attitude came from us just choosing a career that was just kind of like, well, you gotta, you gotta, you know, you're the one that has to clear the path. So yeah. uh, I am constantly, 
Look, I remember seeing fucking uh, Anthony Hopkins interviewed on Inside the Actor Studio, and James Lipton was just kissing his ass all over it and just just listing everything he's done. And Anthony Hopkins is just super. Yeah. He's like, yeah, okay, great, uncomfortable. And then he was just like, how does it feel to be, um, you know, basically the greatest on the planet, at the top of your game? And he was like, just spend most of my time trying to convince people I'm not a fraud. <laughs> and I was like. That's how we all, oh my gosh, touchdown. I was oh, like, this is great. the greatest thing I've ever heard because that's how I always feel like I'm tricking people. It's my last job. And then my wife will be like, oh, yeah, workaholic? Sure, yeah, your last job. Anyway, I'll see you later again because you're going off and working again. I'm like, yeah, okay, I understand now. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you, uh, I don't think there's a pill to stop being a maniac uh, other than, you know, Xanax. Uh, yeah, well, I fucking love Xanax. So wait, then, then walk me through. I'm curious because I think I could probably do this, but I'd love to hear you do this. Walk me through before success and then the first taste of success. Then like, I, I'm, I'm, like I'm saying like before, when, you, when you came out here, I, I'm, I'm, I first met you just as a straight up actor, acting classes. Um, we did a th- that thing. I don't think this got released on the cabin, but we did a thing together for, Bud, for Budweiser. We did like an audition reel. And you were amazing in it. And then, and then that, that guy, that Joel of, and then going to like the soup and then, and then the soup and community, which is like two, two, I mean, how many jobs did you have at that time? And then, and then movies and then, and then like, and I, I'm curious cause I'm really obsessed with the idea of like, well then I'm not saying, I'm not saying you have more money and you don't have to work again, but I'm saying like when the point when maybe the ambition is still there, but maybe that craziness of being young and, and the hunger is like different. It's a different taste, but start me at the beginning. Start me at the beginning. All right. Well, I was masturbating. No, I, well, the first time I tasted it uh, for real was um, I got on this show in Seattle called almost live, which is where um, like Bill Nye, the science guy came out of, and this, uh, these amazing guys, uh, uh, John Keister, a guy named Ross Schaefer, way back when, like, I mean, it's the early 80s. It was a s- local sketch comedy show that was produced on, that was produced on a, a, a NBC affiliate that bumped SNL to 12.05. So it was a local show. And the thing was a huge hit uh, and it had been for years. And these, gr- like, uh, the Bill Nye Science guys voiced Pat Cashman, who's this big celebrity in Seattle. He was this mentor, but I, um, I got an internship on that show and eventually became a cast member. But uh, it, during the internship, it was the time when television, if you were on television that next day, people were like, Hey, I saw you. And, uh, and the show was this huge hit. And so nobody took me seriously, including most family members that I was going to be the actor running around. Uh, doing plays and stuff and my friends made fun of me and I mean not that I, I was I would you know I was larger than them but they were all my friends were going to law school and I was just like I can't I can't even read and so soon as I got on almost live it was just like this they have switch was flipped and people are like well aren't you like you're on tv now huh and I was like oh this is what it, this I see I see. This is how quickly people change. Not that they were all dicks and because a lot of people thought, you know, I should go into entertainment. But I was like, oh, this is what it feels like when you're on TV because you walk around and people say nice things and all of a sudden things change. And um, so then was this was this like 98, 97, 94, 95, 95. But I started appearing in 94 while I was in college. And, uh, and I graduated in 95 and thankfully, thankfully my wife agreed to marry me a year later. But, uh, then I thought, okay, this is a good, sh- I, I'm doing okay, but I need to learn how to act. So I went to graduate school, every single graduate school rejected me except for the university of Washington. So thank God for them. And I got to silence this shit. Uh, excuse me. And I, I, I silenced my phone, but the watch stays on. It's great. So, um, uh, then I moved to, so I went to graduate school, moved to LA and then worked in a wine shop because, uh, and that was a weird thing. Cause I'm like, Oh, I sent them all these tapes. Nobody was interested. Couldn't get an agent, uh, nothing. And this guy, this director named Sandy Smolin, 
kind of took a pity on me and, and like was giving me co-star work. I literally did like I, I went to New York and I met with the casting director of Guiding Light. And he was like, hey, man, I really think you're funny. You're not good looking enough to be on this show. But hey, when you're in town, just call me and I'll put like a I'll put like a cop uniform on you or like a sandwich shop guy. And you can I'll make you you can get 500 bucks for the uh, for your day. And that'll pay for your trip to New York. I'm like, Thanks, dude. And um, <laughs> I was so nice of him. And I worked at Larchmont Wine and Cheese. And that was a weird because I couldn't. That's a great, by the way. That well, the sandwiches at Large Mont Wine and Cheese are my favorite sandwiches in the fucking world. They are remarkable. And anybody listening, wh- whatever country you're in, if you come to Los Angeles, go to Large Mont. It's uh, wine and spirits, but their sandwiches. The black oh. first ham, the turkey. Oh, I used to make those. A lot of them. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the French girl I worked with the day I wasn't there. She was young. Uh, she ran her finger through the the rotating meat slicer and she almost lost her hand. So uh, yeah, it was great, but um, I'm really taking a long time to explain this. I got a co-star on Will and Grace because I lied about my height. I think it's a sexuality. <laughs> uh, yeah. I said I was six, seven and I went to a, the Skechers boot outlet store and got three inch heels of these crazy boots. So I could appear to be taller and I got this little co-star and then I, that worked and, uh, and I got an agent. They um, dropped me a year later because I booked nothing. And then I couldn't get an agent. And I just start, I had a commercial agent. Thank God for AKA agency. Uh, and I started making money doing commercials. I, I, I remember the day I was like, Oh, I don't need it. I don't need to have a job. I have enough money. I may, I just made like 60 grand for the year. And I can survive on that. And then it got better. And then um, I still didn't have an agent when I got the soup. And the soup took forever. I auditioned in January. And we didn't start doing anything until like April. And not because they were doing a nationwide international search. It was just because they were like, yeah, maybe we'll bring this back. I don't know. And um, so through a series of meetings, and they were like, all right. And then I did a five-minute pilot presentation and they're like oh it's gonna be this cheap fine let's put it on call it the soup and we'll maybe and then that slowly it took a year before people watched it which was great because i can't fucking read and i was reading teleprompter for a living and so it took me four hours to get through 20 minutes of jokes and uh, so that got better. And I just slowly, slowly started working. And so that was like a, a plane. So it's like a plane in, in Fast and Furious that goes along the runway for 26 miles. And um, but I'm trying to think when I, oh, I know that when I, re, I, I guess the moment that I felt it when you, you and I have talked about was when Steven Soderbergh asked to see, asked for me to audition. And I was like, how does he know? And they were like, well, you're on TV. I'm like, Oh yeah. Okay. And so that's, that really helped. Uh, and, um, so that was, but there wasn't like, I'm trying to think of a, I think the most, like the big, like when I was asked to be on Sesame street, I was just like, I cannot believe what my, what has happened. I don't know how this happened, but I am so fortunate anyway. So yeah. So then I, 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 Got barely got community. Thank God for Dan Harmon and the Russo brothers because they fought for me. And yeah, then I had, I'm one of those people. And I think you're exactly like me. You're an extreme extrovert golden retriever. And uh, I just do not say no. I just kept saying yes. And then at one point my wife was like, "Uh, you have a new, two new babies and uh, you haven't taken a day off in, I don't know, a year. Because I was like, I would fly somewhere to shoot something, and then it. Yeah. Would, I, I I was always like, well, when this this is gonna run out soon, so I better just oh get God. it all together. I just I get yeah, that the, this the feeling of just like like I'm being chased by the the bad acting police or the uh, police that say, oh, you can't do that anymore. This is, you come come on back down to earth. So uh, that that, that and so yeah, during Community and the Soup and. Like I was shooting spy kids for three months and I was like, Oh, I am, I am, I knew you probably go, I knew I was getting tired when I would begin to hallucinate. 
And uh, I, because I, I can pretty much stay up for days, but as soon as I start seeing things, I'm like, oh, you are very tired. So uh, that that's that's a that's my monologue for the day, which I would like to know. Uh, so that's that's a very um, truncated, but uh, I'm going to say pretty amazingly described career. Thank you. Did you did you did you did you like? I remember the first job I got. I, I was made. I, I remember I didn't do the math right. They told me it was five thousand dollars a week, and I was in the car with my buddy Eddie Fernandez. We were at the corner of Vine and uh, Vine and Franklin, like right to you know cross under the one hundred and one, kind of. And yep. I go, and they told me it's five thousand dollars a week, and I stopped and I went, "I'm a millionaire." And my buddy, my buddy Eddie, who's dumb as I am, goes. We're going to Vegas this weekend. You're a millionaire. We're celebrating. And we went to Vegas and spent the first two weeks of my salary that night. I mean, within a heartbeat. Uh, what year was that? That was 2000. That was in 2000. What, yeah. was, the, what was a physical thing you bought that was like, oh, I'm just like, I'm, I remember Chris Cornell going like, I bought the uh, I bought a Jeep Wagoneer and a um, the Adams Family pinball machine, and I was like, "That's so great." <laughs> my there- first my first thing was uh, a I, I had fantasized about an expedition. I had been in an expedition. I couldn't imagine what type of person could afford an expedition, and I went down to the to the Ford. I went down to the Ford dealership on uh, on uh, on Santa Monica. Da- and I went down there and I, the guy had long blonde hair. He looked like a pro wrestler. And I told him and I filled out, I had never bought a car. I'd never filled out anything out. And I had, at the time I just had a development deal with Will Smith the year before. And I had a development deal with CBS. And so I had that money and then I had the money I was earning. And so I wrote that down and I, and I remember, I mean, now, now it does not to be disrespectful, but now it doesn't seem like $5,000 a week is like as much as I thought it was then. But mm-hmm. I, and I remember the guy going, I was in a Jason Williams basketball jersey, shorts and a flip and flip flops. And he was like, yeah, this doesn't track. And I was like, I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you have no credit. You have no history of anything. And all of a sudden you're saying you make $5,000 a week. And he goes, get the fuck out of here. And so I left, I left, I walked out and I called my dad. I was going to try to do this without my dad. I thought I can buy a car without needing my dad's help. I called my dad. Who's whose buddy owned a Ford dealership in Tampa. And I said, I, they won't let me buy a car. And he goes, what do you mean that you got money? And I was like, yeah, they won't. They say, I don't, I don't qualify. Like I didn't have certain things. I didn't have a home phone number, which was a big red fl- sign, like, like red flag. I didn't have a home phone number. I, I don't think I had an address at the time. Like I, I didn't, I didn't have a place to live. I was just floating around. Yeah. I'm, and, kind, of on, I'm kind of on the side of the guy that said, get the fuck. Out of here. Yeah. I, there was a lot that didn't track. And, and, uh, like my address is New York and my address. Cause I was like, I had just gotten a show moved out. I'm staying on someone's couch and I needed a car to get back and forth to work. And so, um, and I was staying at my buddy Eddie's house. I was like, I, I'm, I'm fresh out of college. I was like, I'll crash on the couch. I don't None of that bothered me at all. And so my dad's buddy called up, um, that Ford dealership and said, Hey, uh, my, my friend's son got rejected for a car, but he's got money. And his dad can help him out if he doesn't have money. Like, trust me, he has money. So whatever, have the car that he wanted ready for him. And he's going to come down and pick it up. And I went down and it was a black and tan Eddie Bauer expedition. And I fucking loved that car. I was so proud of that car. It's like everything I wanted in a car. I would fucking love that car. I, me and my buddy Eddie used to get, we used to take chicks out on dates and we would have, them sit up front and then we'd lay down the middle section and we'd sit limo style in the back. I mean, we were like the most broken dudes. It was, uh, it was, but that was, that expedition was like, and I remember hearing like Dane said he bought like a Maserati and Rogan bought like a, like a fucking, uh, like some ridiculous McLaren or something when his first paycheck, just leasing a fucking car was like a big, like the car that I had seen and like people yeah. have. I it's was new. It's a new car. Which oh. is, wait, did the dude say anything when you showed back up? Uh, no, he was actually still kind of a dick. He was like, uh, he was like, I, I guess you, I guess you got, I guess your dad called. I was like, yeah. 
And he was like, well, the car's ready. I guess if you can pay for it, it's yours. And I was like, I can definitely pay for it. And then I was like, you know, I wasn't lying. And he was like, sure. And I was like, okay. It was, the guy was a dick. It was. Now, an I, now I hate that guy. He I looked like him. a professional wrestler. He had long, long blonde hair. He looked like a legit, looked like a professional wrestler. It's so funny when you look back in life and you think that you dealt with adults and you realized, oh, that was just a 28 year old. <laughs> yeah. That was a 35 year old man in the, in 2000 was like a 50 year old man. I'd like to give a shout out to today's sponsor, Whoop. A lot of us are trying to get back into shape. I know that I am. And there are a lot of challenges for us to make that happen. Some people are able to work out with personal trainers, but not everyone has access to that or can afford that. Whoop is the most powerful fitness membership there is out there. And it's here to help you with that right now. Whoop's a fitness tracker, the best fitness tracker I've ever used. That literally is like having a personal trainer on your wrist for less than a dollar a day. It's one of the only fitness wearables that helps quantify how well you can perform with your, how well you're performing, your sleep is, and your recovery. I use it to track key metrics like my heart rate variability, resting heart rate, respiratory heart rate, and my sleep. I find that when I quit drinking, all of a sudden my resting heart rate drops all the way down to like 50. And when I'm drinking, it floats up around 69. I can know that because my whoop is on my wrist nonstop. It really is like having a personal trainer that knows so much about you. When you wake up, you get a recovery score that lets you know how well your body's ready to perform that night based on how it rested. And then you get to set target exertion goals on the strain coach. I use a strain coach when I work out. I literally hit the strain coach, put it on my treadmill, and I work out as hard as my strain coach tells me. My strain coach knows how hard I need to work out based on my sleep and my recovery. It's absolutely amazing. It's the best fitness tracker out there, and it's the best one of the best fitness trackers and memberships I've ever seen for literally just $30 a month. You get personalized insights 24 seven that quantify the data and help you better understand your body on a deeper level. Whoop goes beyond just tracking calories and heart rates. It monitors sleep, strain, and recovery with personalized feedback in real time, all within their app. It's the big reason I recommend this to anyone trying to get in shape or if you're just trying to build a better, healthier habits and lifestyle in general. For my listeners right now, Whoop is offering 15% off all memberships. Give Whoop a shot. You will not regret it. I'm telling you. And if it's and and if it's not for you, they offer a 30-day return policy. No questions asked. Just head over to whoop.com. That's W-H-O-O-P.com. And enter Bert at checkout to save 15% off. Join Whoop today. Sleep better, recover faster, and train smarter with Whoop. This podcast is brought to you by Fiverr. The way we work changed literally overnight. And if there's one thing we've learned, it's that you need to learn how to adapt your business and have access to the right resources to do that. It's crucial to maintain a strong digital presence. You're talking to the guy whose literally business is based off his digital presence. 2020 has been literally the upside down year. So how can your business plan for the unexpected and operate virtually like your boy whose business started doing that? I literally said, how do we do this? How do we work sideways in this? You got to find the right talent and finding the right talent can be time consuming, frustrating, and outright expensive because they can bend you over if they know you need you. It's difficult to keep up with the best practices to maximize your digital presence. Fiverr's online marketplace connects businesses with freelancers offering hundreds of digital services, including graphic design, check out uh, the, the two bears, one bowl, uh, what's artwork. You like that? Copywriting, web programming, film editing. I definitely need that. And more very easy fibers, global network of on-demand freelancers is here to help. Whether you're just launching your first business or scaling your current business right now, if you're in need of extra support or just want to complete a project, you can find exactly what you're looking for instantly. It's super easy. You can customize your search by deadline, service, price, seller review, and more. There's no more guessing games. You know exactly what you're paying for upfront, no negotiating needed. And that is where I get screwed all the time. Pricing is always based on project, not hourly, and you can get 24-7 customer service reach out with questions anytime, anywhere. And the best is they have a network of quality talent that you can count on. This time is difficult for all of us, but doesn't have to hurt your business. Not with Fiverr. Check out Fiverr.com and receive 10% off your first order by using my promo code, BERTCAST. That's BERTCAST, F-I-B-E-R-R.com and receive 10% 10 off your first order by using my promo code, BERTCAST. Find all the digital services you need in one place at Fiverr.com, F-I-B-E-R-R. ERR.com and use code BERTCAST. Again, that's fiber.com and the promo code's BERTCAST. You were married. What was your first purchase? I think I, I'm trying to think of, okay, I remember like when I was on television and 
Seattle. But I went straight to the Tower Records and bought every Beatles album on compact disc. And I was just like, hey, uh, look at that. There you go. <laughs> they were like, that'll be $140, you know, whatever it was. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's a deal. Uh, boy, I... I think, okay, I took my wife and fam. This sounds really snooty, but because uh, I love food so much, uh, I took them to the French Laundry up in Napa because my friend Ethan had gone to the French Laundry. And, you know, it was like, at that point, it was just like this legendary, like, it's on this list and it's a thing and you can't get a reservation. And then I had to have like a friend call to help me out to get in. And I got in and I spent like literally, and I had a business manager at that point and he called me. He was like, you spent this much money on dinner? And I'm like, yep, I did. And they're like, he's like, you got the wine pairing. I was like, everybody did. I just, just, I, yeah, I just <laughs> want to do it. And I, that was one of the like, oh, this is, that, that was like extravagant. And I, uh, I, I was like, I'm coming back here when I find someone else to pay for it. But um, I, I just was, I was, I, w- I was like one of those things where I'm like, I dreamt about going here. I couldn't look at the bill because I was too scared. And so, uh, yeah, that was, that was it. Yeah, that was. Any, anytime you get to take your parent, your kids, we took the girls one time, right when the thing started to like, I started to sell some tickets um, in clubs. I, we, we took the girls to England. My buddy was producing a movie over there and, uh, and he had a big house and he was like, come on over. My our kids are really good friends. And he's like, come on over. And I was like, great. So I flew the girls over. Didn't even think about any of it. Flew the girls over. I was in Seattle that weekend. I flew over late, right? Right. And, um, and we, we were taking the girls up to where Shakespeare grew up or wherever. And uh, Transport upon Avon? Oh, I've been there. Okay. And, we're, and we stopped. We have, a, we have a, a sprinter. A guy's driving us around. We have a sprinter. And we stopped for, breakfast, or for lunch on, the, on this river. And... And our friends get out and go in and my wife stops everyone. It's just me and my girls in the car and the, in the sprinter. And my wife goes, I just want to say that um, your father paid for all this. And, and the girls are like, what? And they're like, just by telling jokes, by coming up with ideas and telling the people that afforded all of this. And then she looked at me and she goes, you should be really proud of yourself that you not travel channel, not a television network that you could sell tickets for jokes and afford this trip for your family. It's an amazing trip. Thank you. And then Isla goes, are they any good? I go, what? And she goes, the jokes. I go, Isla. And then Georgia goes, Isla, it doesn't matter. We're in England. <laughs> I'm like, oh, these fucking idiots. And so. Listen, I, li- I know dad is a hack, but <laughs> for some reason, that sort of, Lowest common denominator is resonates with his audience. So yeah. just, just not question it and just let him just shit the bed. Every time he goes out, there, <laughs> people eat it up. So they love it anyway. I didn't have the heart to go. I take my shirt off on stage. <laughs> that, but that was that those moments are like, so it's crazy when you do make a, when you have a creative feel that you, what was it like? Cause I feel like you're a little more grounded in the, in the vulnerability of our careers than maybe say someone like a Chevy Chase who is in a weird way gets knighted like when he's 28 and then all, and I, and I witnessed that from people like our age, I saw people get knighted at a young age and then they were like, I'm magic. This is what I do. I just make magic. And they're, and sometimes they're not all that talented, but because they got knighted at an early age, their fucking brains are broken. Like, did you, you don't have to shit on Chevy Chase, but like, was it weird? Yeah. I know everyone fucking does apparently, but I've never, I've never met him, but was it weird watching someone like that versus someone like you who felt like, like, Oh, this could all be taken away. I got to bust my ass. I got to work really hard as opposed to someone who's like, it'll, I'll get another one, you know? Yeah. I mean, obviously Chevy was in a, uh, a world where he became, you know, a, a white hot supernova of a celebrity. I mean, yeah. it was, that I mean, he, he was recognizable around the planet, and that that is you know that sort of success with Saturday Night Live being such a massive hit and true cultural phenomenon that only comes around once every I don't even know how long. I mean, I can't. It's hard to predict that thing. You know, like you can't. Uh, and obviously, Chevy had 
you know, uh, he was helped create that thing and an entire, an entire persona and was literally the most successful comic of the 1980s. I mean, he was the highest paid comic of the 1980s. And that is insane. I mean, Fletch, Caddyshack, I mean, all his all the vacations, vacation, yeah. all the vacations, all the vacations. Yeah. He, he is like, it, I get bummed when I hear negative stories about him because I go, I go, I've, Ed, there's not, there's even like his bad movies. I still fucking liked. Right. Yeah, he, he definitely, you know, he knew, you know, he knew how to deliver when he was on screen and uh, no doubt, you know, I mean, I just, uh, what was the movie that what, modern problems? If you look at modern that, problems, yeah. uh, what was it? Funny farm? No. Uh, funny farm is fucking amazing. Yeah. Look at that dog run. Look yeah. at that dog run. His delivery. Yeah, I mean, he's Do the deer. I man, there's so many fucking. I Funny Farm's a great goddamn movie. It, it, it truly is. I'm, and I, I was, wait, I'm gonna pause. I, I, how much of our personalities do you think is derived from guys like Chevy Chase or Bill Murray? Because I feel like right. I'm almost 100 percent derived by guys like Chris Farley, John Belushi, Bill Murray, Chevy Chase. Those are my my comedic sensibility as a child was to was to make one of their jokes when in question of how to be funny. Yep. No, between I right, I think we like between Steve Martin and uh, uh, Robin Williams, Monty Python, uh, and then I couldn't stop listening to um, Bill Cosby records. That's all as a kid. I was just Bill Cosby records constantly. That worked out. And um, you know, you're right though. But so then they become like um, gods, right? They become like folklore. You you recite these things to pass them along and you go like, this is how you, this is how I learned the ways of the village. Like this is how we learn. This is our craft. And then you begin making your own. And so, I mean, you know, when you met those people, you, I mean, I have a hard time kind of staying calm. I, I usually like, I'm perfectly fine with celebrity, but when I, when I realize they've touched the wire in of my of my of a child in me, I'm like, hold on, just calm down. Like I like I was in a thing with Steve Martin. I'm just like, just remain calm the whole time, and maybe he'll be he'll 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 find you okay. And so, uh, but going back to Chev, you know, I've always been uh, pretty like the guy didn't really want to be a community, so uh, it was and and uh, you know, story. There's all sorts of stories that fly around, but yeah, he's. He is a, uh, it, it was tough a lot of the time. So, uh, and I don't think he would disagree with that. I mean, yeah. we, phys we physically fought. So, uh, oh, for real? Yeah. I mean, we, we, I pushed him around and he's pushed me around. So, uh, that is, that is a whole thing. I, believe me, I didn't think that I would ever be standing over Chevy Chase after I, after he came at, at me. But that's, uh, uh, he he um yeah he left the show after four seasons and that for him anyway going back to uh, our <laughs> the legends you meet uh you know but I, I, like Eric Idle did a sketch on the soup and I could it was in Monty Python I was just like I can't and the other guy in the sketch was my friend from fifth grade who I hired to be on the soup who was Mankini and an amazing writer and I was just like I cannot believe we are standing here with Eric Idle doing a sketch with my friend from fifth from Catholic school. We're here. And I was like, oh, I'm going to burst out crying. I need to hold on to what's happening. Uh, so that was, uh, was just bananas. But I think you're right in that some people that are knighted early on, sometimes I, I feel like they get weeded out if they're not great. I feel like it because there's a lot of examples of like, this is the guy. And then, you know, a couple of movies later, it's not the guy. And then and then they're just, you know, then they then they're just. I don't know, in their car doing uh, black hash. I don't uh, know. Yeah. I'll tell you someone who got knighted early who has not let down at all is fucking Dr. Ken. Ken, go. Ken got, Ken got, I remember watching, he was so goddamn funny, man. You could not follow him. He was so fucking funny. He still is. I mean, I'm not saying he, but, but then was such a, like, such a, like a slider you didn't see coming. And oh, yeah. destructive. And then you saw him in movies like The Hangover and you're like, Holy shit. And he is the sweetest guy in the fucking world to this day. The sweetest guy in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I always make fun of him. 
whenever I'm in interviews, but uh, cause you know, cause he's so, cause we have that podcast, but we, he, he's also a fucking doctor, yep. which we, you and I were like, we're going to pursue this thing and that's it. And he's like, I'm going to be a doctor for 12 years and be really good at it. And then I'm going to go into comedy and be a star. And uh, he's, I mean, I remember when they said he's going to be a part of community, he wasn't, he was added like late in the game. And we were like, well, how did that happen? Why is he, why is he's, we're like, why was he agreeing to be in it? And that's where we're like, he's a movie star. And then you realize he loved the script and, and then just delivered like nobody's business. And yeah, I mean, he's one of those guys that you can't, I mean, speaking of Donald Glover, you know, coming out. That's the guy. That's the other guy I want to ask you about because he is someone who like, I, I feel like I want like, He's the kind of guy that's like, hey, man, I baked you a cake for your birthday. And you're like, this is the best cake I've ever had. Are you a baker? And he's like, ah, I tried. I try. You know, it's like yeah. everything that guy does is like gold. Yeah, no, he's got the same. Like Ken, he's got that. He just has more going on than I mean, he would. We were all screwing around in between takes and he would, too. But most of the time he had just his earbuds in and was writing music. And he, ju- you know, I mean, we all. We hope for a consistent job. We hope we get a certain look. He just had a vision that was, you know, just much bigger. And we were like, are you crazy to leave the show? It's a working show where it's working and we we're making money. And he was like, no, I've got some other ideas. And uh, most for most people to most people when they leave shows, it doesn't usually work. But yeah. then there are the handful of people like Michael J. Fox, you know, that step in and go, no, 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 I got this or, or Woody Harrelson or something. And, you know, he had his, I knew he had the vision for Atlanta before while he was on community. And, you know, I think he, he knew, we all knew his music. I remember seeing him in, we, he was at a club in Brooklyn and I was after, um, uh, what is it? Uh, the, 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 the album with bonfire with outsiders on it and, uh, our backpackers. And I was just like, Oh shit. It's, this is not a, this is not, um, I'm trying to, without being insulting, this is not some celebrity <laughs> who has a band on the side and people only go to the shows because that celebrity is in the band. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think these people. This isn't know. Dog Star. <laughs> yeah, oh, how dare you? That's my favorite band. Uh, yeah. And I just remember going like, oh, this is for good, get, a good, buy, get at, get going. Just, you, you got it. It's, it's on, you're on your, on your way. And obviously now it's just, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is America. Talk about, you know, what a piece of art. Uh, so yeah. And he's that he's and everyone on the cast, uh, like he and Jim were the two of the best improvisers I have ever seen. And Donald would just keep us I, he was just the funniest person. I mean, I, I know now I'm not trying to say like, and then that's when we realized that he was the greatest. That's not how I'm not saying, I'm just like, he's so funny. And um, you get to see that some of it in Atlanta, but he's so funny. And it kind of, it's once again, yeah, I knew, I know he's so funny. That he's like, it's hard. It's hard to, it's white hot. It's so crazy. So you just, it's one of those guys who are like, you can't, you're never going to compete with that. You yeah. just have to, support it and go like that's the greatest so uh yeah so anyway that and he's it was and we saw each other or we had that reunion for that community reunion where we read the script out loud for um the uh world central kitchen which was like i i just burst out crying for an hour afterwards because i was like oh that was a family reunion of a family i really love and and i miss them to death i feel like i feel like that's what sometimes you get on a tv show the first TV show I was on, I remember one of the guys goes, you don't know how good you got it. One of the like grips. And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, this doesn't happen often. We're like, you work with people and you guys all party at night. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, like most TV shows, everyone just goes home. And he's like, you guys have like a thing where everyone goes out Thursday night and everyone parties and you guys all know each other. And I used to buy, I used to do Big Mac Mondays where I'd buy, they had dollar Big Macs at the time. So I'd buy a hundred Big Macs and everyone got Big Macs just in the middle of like, like it. At five o'clock when everyone was tired of shit, I just bring in a hundred Big Macs. And he's like, he's like, you'll miss this. And I remember when that show ended, I was so depressed. I was like, I was but like, you, know you, you helped create that culture. Oh, I'm, I'm, I, well, I strong arm. I strong arm everyone into being, cause I have a 
it, whatever my fucking issues are, I strong arm everyone into becoming a family because I love it. When we were on Travel Channel, anyone that ever worked with me, save except for like, a, I'm sure a handful of people, but like for the most part, those people that I worked with, that was the best job they ever had because we did, and we traveled the world and we did everything together. We get done. I was just looking at videos last night on my phone, like trying to flip through. And we were, we were in Hawaii swimming with sharks. And I remember we got done the segment and I was like, how much more time do we have? And they were like, well, we have another hour out here. I was like, everyone get in a cage. Everyone was like, what? I was like, drop the gear, get in the cage, swim with sharks for a second, get the GoPros. Everyone get a shot with you and the sharks. And there's a video. And this guy, Eric Mazur, it was my producer was, didn't know I was filming on my phone and he, he just popped up and he was like, Oh yeah, I got a, I got a rough job. I'm a TV producer and I'm just swimming with sharks after my shoot. He was like, this is fucking awesome. I found it on my phone, but I'm, I've always forced. And I do that with my tour. Like I make everyone hang out. Well, now we're in a bubble because of COVID. So everyone's got to stay on the bus at all times, <laughs> so but I'm, I'm hardcore, but I love that. That's my favorite part of a TV show. That, that be, yeah, because it almost becomes like secondary because you love these people so much and you're so happy that you're a family and you know there's all sorts of actors in town that they're like instead of being grateful and wanting the place to be fun they're like oh yeah i deserve this and i'm the king and i am going to make people's lives miserable just because yeah. it's my pleasure and or for because i'm not even thinking about them and that's just terrible it's so I never, under, I never understand those people. No, it's I don't. It's something that happened to them when they were a kid that they need to work out, and I don't know what that is. But your travel, just I have pitched so many travel shows because I want to travel the world and have a, and stand and jump around on camera, and none of them have sold. So I'm like, damn it! Oh, it's I, I don't even know where you'd sell a, tra a travel channel. Shout out to Matt Butler, who's definitely watching this. He uh. They, 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 uh, mostly if, and like, unless not to tell their business, Matt's like, shut the fuck up. Let me just buy what shows I want to buy. But like, uh, their business model has got to be, it's got to be, um, uh, spooky, not spooky. Um, like, uh, like about the paranormal. That's where, that's what's working for them right now. So unless you've got a paranormal idea, they, they can't do it. They would, I, they would love to work with you. It's just, you know, the problem is Bourdain defined the travel genre. So anything, anything that isn't Bourdain is ultimately derivative of Bourdain. Yeah. And so his yeah. show was so good. Yeah, it was once in a lifetime. Uh, and then I see like Conan doing his travel stuff. And I'm like, oh, yep. So Conan could do that anytime he wants. And it's yeah. funny. Uh, obviously very different. But uh, yeah. wait, did you say it was your birthday? It is my birthday, yeah. Happy birthday, Bert! I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez, what are you 40, doing working on your birthday? Uh, I'm working all day. I, I have not. I'm, I'm usual. I'm, I do not take a day off. Someone wrote. Uh, my manager, Reg, wrote. Uh, <laughs> we're obsessed with Jocko Wilnick. Do you know who Jocko Wilnick is? No. Oh, oh. he's an ex Navy SEAL. I'm writing a bit about him because I try to get my daughter. He wakes up at four forty five in the morning, and. Uh, my daughter Isla has a hard time waking up and I showed her a video of him explaining why he wakes up and how to wake up and how to approach the day. And she mocked him fucking unrelentless, like just could not stop making fun of him. And I'm like, baby, no one makes fun of Jocko. Like he is a badass. He is like the, he is the most, he's like the alpha male in, 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 in podcasting. Definitely him and Rogan are really tight. He's in jujitsu, jujitsu, a bow hunter. He's like fucking a badass. And my daughter who has no idea who is, is just tearing him apart. She's fucking 14, lighting into this guy. She goes, he got go. I said, she does, obviously she doesn't know what a Navy SEAL is. She, he says he gets up at 4.45 in the morning and Isla goes, what is he, a farmer? I said, no, he's a SEAL. And she starts laughing hysterically. I go, no, it's not the SEAL you think, Isla. He's not a SEAL. Oh my God. Like, so, um, but yeah. my, my manager, Reg, said, uh, Jocko Wilnick doesn't sleep, doesn't, works on his birthday. You work on your birthday. Because we've been like, I'm obsessed with him. I think he's fucking, there are certain guys I got to, when I got, when I got let go from travel channel, I started finding like, uh, I call them channel markers, but like people that I thought were going in the right direction in the world that I wanted to, I wanted to look at as like, 
goalposts. As like, as like, a, and you know, growing up in Florida, you always took the channel markers where how you got out to sea and how you got back in. Right. And so I found people that I called channel markers. Casey Neistat was one of them. You ever know who Casey Neistat is? I'm really swinging and missing here. They're all they're all YouTube personalities or podcasters. But like Rogan was the first channel marker, even when I was on Travel Channel, that I was like. Go in if you just get in his wake, you will like you you will succeed. If you just get a little bit in Rogan's wake, because the way he's going and it's the speed at which he's going there is there is success dialed in for anyone, anyone who's willing to just listen. I thought so. People uh, forget. I mean, obviously they're not how funny Joe Rogan is, but they forget what uh, that he was so funny on. You know, a news radio. Oh my god! Um, like radio, uh, news radio was an amazing. Yes, yeah, I mean, amazing. You've got Phil Hartman, and you've got Stephen Root, and you've got uh, uh, Maura Tierney, and uh, what's his name from Kids in the Hall? I mean, these are killers. Dave, uh, Dave, Dave, Dave Foley, Dave Foley, who's yeah, Dave Foley. I mean, Kids in the Hall is one of the greatest sketch series of all time, and he, I mean. Uh, and he just was so fucking funny. That show and, was so good. Yeah, and then you're like, oh, and by the way, he's got a leg kick that can crush a VW bug. And you're like, what? He did what? Like, you can't... Yeah, he's one of those renaissance people that, again, i become extremely jealous of. No, uh, it's, it's, it's... But it's... You know what it is? Is... Um, it's... I found that thing that... that th- maybe... Maybe I, it's... I guess the jealousy I get is like the, insp- I get so inspired. Like when I watch Chappelle, yes. I, I get jealous that I'm not that good. Like I go, wow. But it inspires me to be like, to be like, all right, this sounds silly, but I go like today I was on the treadmill and I was, I was watching the comedy store documentary and I, I'm watching all these great, great, great comedians. Yeah. And I'm, I'm jealous that I'm not as good as them. I'm like, I'm like, come on, Bert. Like you got this. You can do in my head. I'm like, you have the ability to write good jokes. Like, and then all of a sudden I pop up on the screen. And I'm like, Oh, I'm in there with them. So like, let's work, let's work. And then, then I start going like, I, I, I can't imagine why I would love to have the obliviousness of the person who does a sitcom and then just, just goes and does like a couple Taco Bell commercials. And then it's like, is like, man, I'm good. You know, like I'll do some signings at comic con and I'm straight. Like, I wish I could be that person, but I'm not, I am. I, when, you, when you even say stuff like that, I'm just like, is did, do people like that even exist? And they, I think, you know, I think it's everyone that was on the office, I think they all kind of were just like, yo, we're straight, I'm straight with money. Look, I mean, you, you, yeah, I, but everyone I, in the office kept, I feel like most of them like kept kicking ass, right? I it's mean, it's not fair for me. I, I just started watching the office, the American office recently with my daughters. So, like, I don't like, I someone just told me about Oscar, uh, the guy who played Oscar, Oscar Nunez, yeah, yeah, Oscar, oh, is his name Oscar Nunez? Um, Jesus Trejo, we were on the bus and he was like, dude, he is funny as fuck. And I was like, oh yeah, he's good in the office. He's like, no, he's also funny as fuck. And I went, oh, that's right. You forget. He killed it as a character actor in that, but he's also funny as fuck. Yeah. I was an improv troupe with him before the office. Oh, for real? Yeah. And, uh, we, yeah. And he was funny as fuck. And just yeah, he was just one. Of, he was just that. And then you're like, oh, he's one of those guys that you're like, oh yeah, of course he's on TV now. Oh, he's in. He's on Gabe's uh, uh, Fluffy's sitcom. Yes, and he's great. Yeah, and I that, there's another. I got. I was on two episodes of that thing, and I was people start like I were at a gas station. They'd be like, hey Gabriel, and I'm like, what? Oh, people are watching that. Ooh, he has fans. I mean, like, there's like, let me tell you, you get. I don't know if every, I don't know if everyone gets the number. I don't know how Netflix works. Let me rephrase that. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm Netflix. I was going to be like easy, Bert. What the fuck are you talking about? Gabe Gabe's specials are always in the when you go to comedies like stand up comedies. All of Gabe's specials are always being watched at all times. Yeah. He is. He has diehard fans. Joe Coy, him, like oh, yeah. they just they can they made a connection with people. That will never go away. You you can only hope to connect with people like they did. And both of those guys have no business being as nice as they are. You they know? do not. They do not have to be that nice. You yeah. are right about that. That like just it's just, you take it for granted when people just kind of like look you in the eye and answer your questions. You realize you're like, oh, 
He's talking. We're oh, he he doesn't need to. You believe me, you don't. Uh, but they are fucking. They're yeah. I mean, Gabriel Glaze. Because I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. He, he could sell out the Staples Center like for a month every night if he wanted to. I think. And we, I, uh, I mean, Joe. I mean, and like you look at Joe Coy. It's like how many people showed up to his special in the Philippines. I was like half the Philippines. I think, the, I think the island. I think the island. I think yeah. they just put a they just put a fence around the island and one spotlight and a stage. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, they're super. They don't need to be this. Not. I mean, I, I don't know why I'm saying it that way, but it, it, well, no, it's because it's because I feel like guys like me and you have been have been like almost like jobbers. Like we like we work hard, we hustle, and then and then you see these guys like like Gabe or Joe, and they are so charismatic, so fucking talented, so successful. And, and I think, I think me and you being, being like humble, nice guys. And I say that because we're not them, right? They're massive, but like you go, um, you go, you wonder in your head, you toy with the idea. If I was that, if it was that effortless, like to just be that fucking hilarious, would I be that nice? And Gabe, when I first met Gabe, I had never met him. He is a huge fucking star. And I'm at the improv and someone introduces us. And instead of doing what I'm, I'm sure lots of people do where they go, oh, yeah, yeah. What's up? Nice to meet you. He says, oh, yeah, man, I've been hearing your name a lot. It was good to meet you. And you're like, oh, you don't need to say that. You can also just go, nice to meet you. But to take like a step of going like, dude, I've been hearing your name a lot. I heard you're doing big things. And you're like, you're like, fuck. And the, when someone does that, when, it, when shit like that happens, it makes you feel like a billion dollars. It makes you feel just like, I cannot believe that person. I exist on that person's radar. Yeah, it's crazy. Now, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about um, two other things. I'll, I'll get you out of here soon. But one of the yeah, things I want to... I'm here. For, you, this is... We're here till... We're here till the uh, polls close. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> you know, Thursday. The number one, the number one thing that has come up from our our episode of the cabin is Miss Pat and Kelly Cuoco. It is the number one thing people want to talk about is, and I keep saying, I keep saying, you don't know how bad it got for one because it was worse than what we showed, but it was fairly representative. And I think me and you were on the fence trying to negotiate what was not like it wasn't a hurtful me like i don't think pat was trying to be mean but it was you could understand that and, and by the way i have to say this and you don't have to agree but like we recorded that obviously before the racial tensions in america before and so so a lot a of year people, ago we recorded it it was december yeah. wasn't it? it was december january january yeah practically yeah. a year ago and so so there was a that maybe a lot of what people are reading into is stuff that maybe is more more conversational politics now but it was it was a fucking. I would love to know your take on that interaction. Well, I was like, wow, Miss Pat is just trying to push Kelly into this freezing water, and she does not give a shit. And but you could see like the smirk on Miss Pat's face, and then and then Kelly was like, what the fuck's going on? And I don't. <laughs> and so yeah, I I am this. I was the same way where I'm like. Uh, are you being a dick? Not really. No, I don't know what, what you're, and I don't know. Yeah. And I don't know if it was just because, well, Kelly is one of the biggest stars on the planet and literally, literally the most successful sitcom in history. In history. We can make that argument, but I was like, get on any plane and you will see what people just automatically turn to. And I get Seinfeld. It's yes, I hear that, but, uh, the Big Bang Theory is a worldwide phenomenon, and maybe she was just—I don't know. I mean, because I got along with both of them well, and, yeah. Uh, and you're right; it was in, we shot it in January, so <laughs> uh, yeah. I think Kelly was—I was—I I think Kelly was like, "What the fuck's happening?" And I think maybe Pat, Miss Pat, was just like, "I'm just going to go after one of the biggest stars on the planet and see what happens." I don't know. I don't. I don't. I. I don't know. I kept saying, I kept saying there was, I can very honestly say that neither had ever grown up with someone who like, like Miss Pat had never grown up with someone like Kaylee ever, ever. And no. Kaylee probably had never grown up with someone like Miss Pat. I remember at one point we said, I think you said, you know, when she was 13, she was on the biggest sitcom in the country with John Ritter. And 
Miss Pat was like, I was pregnant. Oh no, she she was like, oh, I was pregnant. And Kaylee was like, you were pregnant when I was on the Bing Bang um, on Thirteen Things You Know About Your Kid. And, she, and Miss Pat goes, no, when I was thirteen. And we're and we're like, what? Like the disconnect was so was so there. I remember, and I'm so glad we edited it out, a conversation about Michael Vick that went sideways. And you remember that? And we were like, all right, all right, let's just let's just change subjects here. <laughs> I forgot about, I know, I literally forgot about that. I think, oh my gosh. And I wasn't even drinking. You weren't drinking. You were like, I'm doing sober January. And I remember grabbing your cocktail and putting it down going like... And it was, it, it was, oh, but you getting us out of that segment was the fucking best. Have you seen it? Of you going like, okay, all right, this is over. We're going to get fish. Stand up. We're walking out. We'll see you guys in five minutes. And you just left. All right. I, I'm, I ha- okay. I have a horrible confession. I haven't watched it uh, because exactly. I, never watch, I never watch anything I'm in. So, uh, because I have, I'm, I'm an idiot. So I, uh, it's hard for me. It's just doing that stupid thing where I'm like, it's hard for me to watch myself. Uh, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. But, uh, but it was insanely fun. Uh, I assume the show's doing well. Yeah, it did great. Yeah, see, yeah, it did great. It too. It was number uh, one, uh, number one, number one uh, unscripted series on Netflix. Same thing with the Joel McHale show. Oh wait, mm. <laughs> yeah. that's okay. I, I that show that show was so much, uh, such a fun, fun, fun experience that. Uh, that I I'm so I'm just so glad I'm so glad it happened. It was it was and I got to I got I got to hang out with the funniest people. People keep going, oh, the show was great, Bert. And I go, I didn't do anything really. Like I really just kind of hung back and let everyone else be fucking hilarious. My favorite line of the whole series is, "What's up, Brian Seacrest?" And you go, "What's up, Lizzo?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, this is gonna be a fun tr- fun day." Jeez, oh, I well, and you know, you do the thing like, oh, you didn't do much, but. Much like Howard Stern, he starts throwing ball. He starts juggling all those different balls, and he keeps the whole thing. You know, he's the captain of this insane ship that is incredibly, you know, uh, compelling to watch and listen to. So, yeah, that's you, and you know it. See, compliment uh-huh. it there. I knew it was weird because when I pulled up, I was like, "There's Bert Kreischer. He's almost naked. It's not." It's not warm. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's early. And I was like, he's already, <laughs> he's already wet. So I did, you know, I had lunch with Miss Pat that day and we had a great talk. We she's the best. She's my favorite person in the world. My, my daughters call her Auntie Pat and my wife loves her. They talk all the time. I talked to her the other night. I, Isla watched that episode. Isla, my youngest, watched that episode. And she was what like, did say? she said, um, because you know miss pat has been around my kids and so miss pat doesn't turn it on and off that's who she is and first time she met my daughter she said i'm gonna be your uh your n-word auntie and my daughters are like never had heard that word i mean they've they go to public school so i'm sure they've heard kids say it but never heard they've never heard it in conversation with them and they were frozen they're like and she's like that's right you coming to indianapolis you're living with me and i'm gonna i'm gonna teach you how to live like an, an n-word and the girls are like looking at me for me to go, Hey, this is enough of this language. And she's like, yeah, we're going to get you guys straight. Can I take them, Bert? I go, how long you want them? She goes a month. And my daughter's like, wait, did we just get, are we, are we going to Indianapolis? Like they're freaking out. But Pat and then Pat sat with them that day. We had lunch. This was at a, at a party, sat with them and, and, you know, Pat's funny as shit. And so she's making my daughters cry laughing. And my, but, and she's so real. And my wife and my wife and Pat have very, uh, roughly parallel childhoods in that they were both neglected, both r- a, little, a little bit rougher uh, upbringings, and 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 they both are from the same area of town. They both grew up in Atlanta, outside Atlanta, whatever, and so they have a, a lot of similar experiences, and so they remember a lot of the same things. and And so uh, my daughter watched that episode, and they, she's crying, laughing at Pat, and then she goes, "Wait, oh." Kaylee doesn't get Pat, Miss Pat's sense of humor, I don't think. And I go, no, it's, I go, because she's like, Miss Pat was trying to make a joke. Can you see? And I was like, I see, but yeah, I know what you're saying. And she was like, she was like, oh, I see what's going on. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then Isla just goes, I got to tell you, I love Miss Pat too much. I love Miss Pat. And I was like, I know, I know. You know, like she was trying to drown her at one point. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, that was one of the funniest fucking episodes ever. And have you had Kelly on? No. 
I should. I should. Did I, you, I, did she have, did you ever talk to her? No, no. I she, texted with her a few times. Uh, just to go like, is there, she was like, that was crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was, well, it was, it was, you know, it was a, it was like a real, like the same thing happened. We did another episode. We, we did other episodes and, and that maybe I never mind. Let's pivot the fucking <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm about to get myself in trouble left and right. So wait, I want to also talk to you about knives because we both have an infatuation with knives and, and have been collecting knives. And I posted the, the, uh, the match made the infidel, the yeah. infidel, which by the way, I'm sure I just did this in LA and they're like, uh, you're going to jail. Um, you can have but, them in your home. Oh, good. You cannot carry them around. So what, what got, I, I'm trying to figure out what got me into knives. Cause I started collecting knives when I worked at travel channel. It was like, so it was all of a sudden it was something that would, I could find often. I could search out, like if it was a fishing store or a hunting store or like even a pawn shop or, I, and it would make me excited and I ended up collecting them based on that. And then you'd find a knife and you'd get excited like these, these, these Swedish knives or what Swiss knives or whatever. These are really great knives and you'd find a knife and you'd get excited. You have a knife, your favorite knife. And it was always cool to have a knife in your pocket and someone go, you, you got a knife. And you're like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. What got you into knives? I think you uh, I think the little boy in me just always liked weapons. I don't know what it is. I used to take up my sandwiches and eat it into the shape of a gun and then start shooting people at the dinner table. And my parents were like, just buy him a space gun. Then yeah, uh, but uh, my dad, so my I was born in Europe, thank you. And my okay. mom and dad, my dad was a dean of students at Loyola University Rome Center, and that's where he met my mom. He used to take students, like you could just go to Saudi Arabia and go to Syria. They were pretty, it wasn't, it was pretty safe. And my dad would just bring home like a whip or some weird machete. And I remember finding them as a kid and I took nails and put them into my wall and then hung those up. And so then I was buying throwing stars and I was buying, so I don't know what it is, but I, I have hundreds of them. And it's a problem. My wife is like, you need to put these away. They're everywhere. I'm like, yeah. well, you know, they haven't hit an artery yet. So I feel like we're in good shape. And they drive her nuts. Because now I have swords. I have a bunch of bull whips. And it's, I have um, a couple of spears. I mean, what am I doing? I, but I love them so much. I, I, what's your favorite knife? Oof, that's like saying, which of your children is your favorite? I can tell you my favorite brand. My favorite brand is spider co i love spider co knives so much this is a the one they made for me it says the machine on it but these spider co knives i love the handles i love how sharp they are i love i have probably 20 spider co knives i was it was probably the first knife i got introduced to when we were in colorado they're i think they're made out of golden colorado mm-hmm. and we were doing a segment in colorado and my camera guy was like hey man we're going to swing by spider co and grab some knives before we go to the airport. If you want one. And I was like, I remember going like, ah, eh, I'm cool. And we got to the airport and they met us up at the airport and he pulled it out. And he was like, what do you think? And I remember going like, Oh, I, this is probably one of the, when I first started, I was on doing birth conquer. And I was like, Whoa, I don't, maybe I don't know what, I didn't know what you were doing. I didn't, I wasn't paying attention. Start all over. Like I want to go back. And so I waited and I was like, anytime I got a chance to say, I go in, I go, you guys got spider co. And if they did, I bought all of them. I remember getting a knife taken away from me in Vietnam and it was a spider co beautiful, like a, almost like a bone handle spider co. And I said to the lady, it, it, we were in going through security and I had it in my bag and I went, God damn it. And I said to her, don't let anyone take this. Just take this and give it to your son. She was like, what? I said, give this to your son. This is too good of a knife for them to just throw away. I said, this is an expensive knife. I said, just give it to your son. Do you have a son? She said, yeah. I said, put it in your pocket, give it to your son. She put it in her pocket. And I went, I feel better about it now. I feel better about losing that knife. Knowing some kid, she just walked home. Some kid's like, the fuck is this? That's a great story. Well, hold on. Let me go grab two knives. I'll be right Grab a couple back. knives. Grab a couple knives. I'm looking at knives. I love knives. Just real quick. It'll be so quick. And I'll, I'll hold on. Breaking up with your old wireless provider just got a whole lot easier thanks to Mint Mobile. They were the first company to sell premium wireless services online only. And now Mint Mobile's introducing their new unlimited data plan for just 
30 bucks a month. Let that sit in. Let that sink in. An unlimited plan for 30 bucks a month. How much is your soon to be X wireless provider charging you? Um, They sent Halston a SIM card to try out. Halston, how does that compare to your previous plan? Well, I used to get text messages whenever I was about to go over my data. And then at that point, it kind of slows down. And so it gets like shittier and shittier. But with this one, I can watch unlimited podcasts or stream live sports and stuff like that. And it's been fucking smooth as butter. Let me tell you something. For people that hate their phone bill and are ready to cut ties with big wireless, Mint Mobile offers premium unlimited plan for just 30 bucks a month. Go online only. By going online only, you eliminate the traditional cost of retail. Mint Mobile passes those savings on to you. And those are significant savings. All plans. Come with unlimited talk and text, high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. Keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven-day back money guarantee. Break up with Big Wireless and switch to Mint Mobile Premium Unlimited plan for just 30 bucks a month. To get the new Unlimited Wireless plan for just 30 bucks a month, and get the plan shipped to your door for free. Go to mintmobile.com slash BurtCast. That's mintmobile.com slash BurtCast. Cut your unlimited wireless bill to 30 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash BurtCast. All right, I'm back. Here I go. I'm coming back. <coughs> By the way, I just realized my home run of a knife, I don't have. I got given, I got given, the when we went to Tanzania, I drank goat's blood with the Maasai chief. Oh, and oh. He had told me how he became chief, that he had killed a lion when he was a kid the day before his castration, not castration, uh, 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 they cut his tip of his dick off, whatever. They do it. They put a bone in it, right? They cover him in mud. They cover him in mud, put a bone in it, and then he does it in front of the whole village. And if any of the mud cracks, you're not a man. You're not a man. So when they, what is it? Uh, Circumcise him. And so the day before his circumcision, he killed a fucking lion with this knife. And then he gave me the fucking knife. He gave me the sword. And it's like beautiful. It's actually not, it's actually not that impressive to be dead honest with you. It's kind of like you look at it and you're like, Oh, which shows you that his skill to kill a lion was even more dramatic. And that lion was like, it's not, I'm being killed with this crappy knife. I can't believe it. You got to frame that thing. And part of me, no, it's in our living room. It's 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 really cool. And you could tell it's been used. But then part of me is like, I wonder if he's got a stack of these. And like tourism wise, he's like, yeah, let's drink a little ghost blood. My mom and dad brought me back a knife from Tanzania. And the Maasai guy sold it to them. And they gave it to me. Shall I go grab that? I'm getting mine. I'm getting mine. Get, all right, I'll get mine. Hold on. <laughs> we got to reveal. If, if they're identical, then... Oh man, I'm so excited! <laughs> so wait, so wait. By the way, I had to show you. So my daughter, my daughter Isla, stole one of my spider codes. This one, and keeps it by her bed. She keeps it in her bed, and she also has a straight up sword from from uh, from um, uh, what's the medieval times? A straight up sword by her bed from medieval times. Because you never know, Dad. You never know. I hear. And I think having a knife or sword, a small sword in your home is more effective than a gun because in a great panic, you can see, you see gunfights sometimes, a thousand shots will be shot and no one gets shot. But if you just start swinging with a knife and you're terrified, you're going to connect with something. Yeah. Because every defense is an offense with a knife. Okay, here we go. The Tanzanian <laughs> knife. I want to see yours. The Maasai warrior. Oh my lord! <laughs> the problem is, yeah, it's super hard to get it's out. Super hard to get out. It's that hard. We're it's not so- out of shape. I swear, you guys. <laughs> this is how hard Does this. Your is. handle look like this too. <laughs> Pretty. I mean, it's not as well. We got the hard. same. Yeah, look at that. Look at the end. So, god damn it! Fucking really takes the wind out of my story. <laughs> So I think my parents bought it for like 25 bucks. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's identical. They make these, these are mass produced and they hand them to us going, Hey, you know, I killed a lion with this. And then we're like, Oh, cool. The day before I got circumcised. And I'm like, fucking. So do you think he, it was just that, Oh, this, we mass produced them and I killed a lion with it. Like, how did he pull this out? Like if a lion's coming towards him, he's like, 
give me two or three minutes to pull the knife out. I mean, this is how hard it is. I can't believe that. And by the way, you know what I gave him in return? We have, it's the same end. Yeah. This, these this are, is the exact same fucking exact same sword. It's got the same sort of same little belt loop. Yep. It's got the belt loop. God damn. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You know what I gave him in return? So I was like, thank you so much. And then I handed him a football. because it's all we had. He was like, what oh. do I do with this? I was like, pass it around. If anyone's good at catching it, give me a call. Give him a fucking deal. <laughs> fucking. Luckily, that, yeah, that football is worth a lot. I ended up, we ended up throwing the football and I was like, it's like, just like when you guys throw a spear, it's a football because we we, he taught me how to throw spears also. And so we ended up throwing football around and they were actually pretty good at it. And I was like, awesome. I was like, I'll go deep. And then he, I got hit in the face with the, no, the football and I got a bloody nose. So wait, what other knives do you have? I can't uh, do that. Of course, I can't. Anthony and of course cool. we got the infidel of course but oh, the best. It's, it's, i got blue you got black yours is great i i like a, mi- a microtech knife Ooh. uh they're and then they have the uh that's uh the pressure point to you know push out right. windows and stuff yeah. oh yeah oh because i'll need that one day i definitely by the way i would love to get trapped in a car when i have that on me just love I, it what my friend was in a car accident. She had a pressure point and she let herself out of her Tesla that was wrecked by a drunk driver crawled out the windshield because she pushed it. And oh she, I was like, how did you have a pressure point in your car? She's like, her husband, she's like, Mark said we should all have them. And it worked. So I've got, I've got one of those knives that cuts seatbelts and has a pressure point. I put them all in the cars. That's what, yes. All right. So here's a little, well, here's what I love cold steel knives because they make, Beautiful. This thing is very deadly. And uh, Cold Steel's out of Ventura, California. So you're supporting a local business. I'm writing all of these down. Okay. So here's a fun, quick lesson. So this knife, as you know, you get caught carrying this, you're going to jail. If you get caught carrying this, no jail. Because in California, you any folding knife, it can be any length, but as long as it's fo- as it folds. It, uh, it's fully legal. So you can walk around with a two handed sword oh and it, this is, is razor sharp. I cut, so I cut so much like bones with this thing. You can just put this in your pants and you, put, you can, will not be arrested for it. And oh. why is that? The owner of cold steel told me, he goes, because back in the twenties, when he said all the cowboys carry pocket knife, pocket knives and all the Mexican workers carried switchblades and automatic knives. So, of course, Mr. Whitey made these illegal, but said these are perfectly fine at any oh length. God. So, this, this thing is just, I mean, it's like a baseball bat. I mean, it's, you, could, you can just cut through a car with this thing. So Jesus, that is, is that Cold Steel too? This is Cold Steel as well. This is the Espan, the Espanda or Espanda. They have great videos, by the way, where they'll just click the hood of a car. They'll be like, and, they, and they'll just be pounding through the hood of a car like it's like nothing. And they're like, this is because of the tempered steel. We folded over 6,000 times. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, and they also make very elegant, beautiful knives like that little, like speaking of my name, they put my initials on it. Eh. I love, I, man, that, that little extra when a knife company hits you up and they're like, they're like, oh, I, we got you a special knife. You're like, oh, thank you. By the way, this is, I have so many knives that are empty like all my all my things are empty i don't know where the knives are they're just anywhere and by the way when i was running through the house my wife knew where i was going she yes oh like, just rolled her eyes at me and was like yeah. what's uh what's what what's the fucking knife bobby kelly likes that that he can't get well let me call bobby kelly bobby kelly's trying to get a knife that he oh he goes but but bert if you get one of these fucking knives before me, I'm gonna be so fucking pissed. Let me call Bobby Kelly real quick. The Brandon knife? Is it, it? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if he answers. I forget. It's it's a knife that this one guy makes, and he only makes like a few a year, and they're fucking badass. Oh, there's oh. this. It's picking up. No. There's, I wonder if he's gonna. There's, a, there's a knife maker outside of Seattle whose knives take. He makes like three a year or something, and you know they're so expensive and. And I would love one. Yes, there's. I'll, I'll I'll hit you up and let you know the knife the knife guy. But um, but yeah, I'm. I don't I'm, know why I why I'm so 
Um, well, I don't know why. I think it's a boy. I don't, I, well, I, it's not just a boy. Uh, you know, Anna Ferris. Uh, yeah, Anna she Ferris. has a knife collection, and she has be- uh, just beautiful Japanese knives. And I was like, oh, is it a Seattle thing? Because we're both from there. But I, I don't. I, do, and I have them. I carry them. I keep them in my car. Oh yeah, I always have. I always have a knife on me. I always have a knife on me. What do you think about Benchmade? Do you like Benchmade knives? Yeah, this. That's that's this. That's the Infidel. Yeah, the yeah exactly. The, yeah. I, the bench. By the way, Benchmade makes a smaller Infidel, like a smaller little pocket knife that my daughter Georgia took from me. <laughs> that's she, good. my daughter. My daughters have knives in their backpacks. So they, when I when when you did put that in your story and put that up, and then I did mine immediately. Uh, you did. Oh, this guy I know who was in the uh, Marines. Uh, he was like, "Oh, yeah, that's the one we all would use." Really? Yeah. So he, I believe he was Special Forces, but uh, but he was like, "Yeah, that's the one. We love that one." I know they use Microtech and well, it's Microtech and Ultratech is this company. I think they're out of Florida, and then the Infidels out of, I believe, Oregon City, Oregon. And these are the are these Hella Hella knives or is it? How do you say it? I forget. But I these are really. Know. Oh, it's you, right here. Yeah, Hella. That looks like you can take apart a fish. They're beautiful. Uh, it, I, I've, I actually use this to cut up, to trim my brisket today. Um, I make a brisket and I trimmed up uh, my brisket with this. And then my wife put it in the fucking dishwasher. And I was like, what are you doing, woman? I was yeah, like, you know, she should know better. Come on. Yeah. These, um, these, you, uh, these hooks. Yeah, there's, that's that's terrifying, and that that is when you see a knife like that. That's not for uh, utilitary use or for home use. That is for killing someone. That so is the what, only reason. What do you think about? <laughs> by the way, this is like so specific. But what do you think about Damascus knives? Because I've I've always felt like I've always been underwhelmed by them, and it seems to be the what everyone thinks is the right is like the best knife to have. But every time I'm always like, I don't know. I, I feel like I feel bad using it, you know? Because are they I don't even know if I have any. Yes, you definitely do. The Damascus ones are the ones that have the the wrinkles in them throughout the blade. It's it looks like what they do is they t- I watch I actually just watched a video of a guy making a Damascus knife. Damascus steel is they put all these layers of steel together and then they hammer it, hammer it, hammer it, so you can see the layers in it. Right. And I, I've got a few. I wish I had one on me. Is that how but, most knives are made? No, like, no, hold it over metal like this. They're they're not. I mean, we, you know the difference between a knife that's you know pot, you know, just taken out of a sheet and then sharpened, obviously. But mo- but but I feel like, or maybe they're not. But like stuff like this, that that's this super. I feel I, I don't know. I had a Dam- I have a Damascus knife, and I don't know where right I now, put it. Right now, knife experts that are watching this. Oh yeah, real knife guys are losing their fucking shit. They are, they are so mad right now. I also collect like. Uh, what do you call it? Like uh, brass knuckles, and uh, I yeah, I, it's it's a, I just have way too. It's sad. I have bags. I, of I, Bert, I, bushcraft uh, bushcraft knife is the one that Robert Kelly is the says is the holy grail. Bushcraft knife. Have you heard of that? Bush- How did you do that? How did you find that, Holston? A YouTube open transcript, and then I searched his Birdcast episode. You guys talking about it? Went right to it. Bushcraft, bushcraft knives. I'm looking it up now. Uh, top twenty bushcraft. It doesn't even say price. Yeah, I think they're. I think the guy makes them. What if it was like the Tanzanian knife, where like, oh yeah, there's one right here for thirty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, well, what's the big deal? Well, what the? Oh no, I don't know. Okay, I'm now. I'm going to. There's just you know they're good if there's just articles on them. Uh, you know what I'm doing now. I, um, we're going to end this podcast and I'm going on and I'm b- online and I'm buying a bunch of fucking knives for my birthday. I'm going to go buy. I w- what's that one? You just, the smaller one you said that was made out of Florida. What was that one? I, I like that one. Microtech. Uh, it's the Microtech knife and the, and the ultra tech. What's interesting. If, if you can see real close here, they yeah. put the date on the knife that it was made. So that really? was in July of 2014. It's and, and I have a number of them and it's just an interesting, like, Oh, well, this is a six-year-old knife. I don't know why. I mean, it's just an interesting thing for a company to do. Would you be interested if I could get the people at Spider Co. to let us design our own knives? And would you yes. be interested in doing that? Yes, yes, a million thousand times. I know. Yeah. I, I know the people at Spider Co. They've been pretty cool, and they've 
hit me up a couple times and and sent me uh, gear. But I'm it's, but it'd be cool to design. Like, what would like what would you? Go there. In, I'll go like, there. Oh, I'll go there too. By the way, hey, listen, I'll fly us both there private so that we don't get COVID, and we can shoot a segment there, and we'll put it on YouTube, and we'll I will do a fucking podcast from there. I think that's a uh, great idea. Done and done, and that means we can carry him on the plane without checking him. Oh, let's. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Do you realize I will drop fucking twenty grand on knives there? I will walk. I'll just go. Give me one of every knife. I want every single knife, dude. Hey, shout out to Spider Spiderco. Spiderco, make this happen, please. Right now, Benchmade's going. Hold on, hold on. Don't take us out of the loop. We can do this. Walking out with a bag and then trip and then just nine knives sticking out of your back and they're like, they were. They're so sharp, aren't they? Incredible. The quality is nuts. The way it punctured my spleen. Yeah, I I've got a Spiderco in. I got two Spydercos in, in two of my cars right now because uh, I always carry a screwdriver in the car and I got the Spyderco and of course the the seatbelt thing. I don't know. Uh, I really it's it's a problem. And my always carry. That's really it's a very very funny segment to hear of what I always carry, either a joint or a blunt, a knife, and and uh, like oh, always and a flashlight. I'm I'm big with headlamps too. I'm a big headlamp guy. Oh. Like I, yeah. I have a ton of them. I, I keep them on my bunk. In when we when we are on the bus, I always keep a headlamp on my bunk. I have a headlamp by my by my bedside table, and I have headlamps in all the girls' rooms. I'm I'm big about that for earthquakes. I think they all make fun of me. And the other thing I'm into right now is tasers. I love tasers, especially like the big wand. We got we we bought the ones called the attitude adjuster, and we were fucking around with them on the bus. We were gonna play tag, and dude, they're like ninety thousand volts. They're insane. And you were not worried about anyone's heart stopping. Uh, no, we ended up shocking. One of my buddies ended up the, shocking himself with it. And he's like, it's bad, but it's not that bad. And you're like, really? And then, and, then, and then someone's son was like, we do me. And I'm like, that's the person we got to do because he's got a good heart. We don't have to worry about killing him. Yeah. Well, just so you know, I have maybe 10 headlamps. Uh, <laughs> I, I love them. I use them. Uh, when I go out, like I go survey my property. I'm like, okay, we're okay. And it's so oh. very, and I have one taser. So I'm, and a breathalyzer. So I, so it's. I got a breathalyzer too. Dude, by the way, I got to hit you up with the, the headlamp I got. We took it when we went to, uh, fuck, where did we go? Maybe it was in Africa. My, my cameraman got us a headlamp that had a battery pack on the back and a headlamp here. Bobby Kelly, hold on one second. Hey, Bobby, you're on the podcast. I'm with Joel McHale and we're talking knives. What's the knife that you, was it the Bushmaster that you were like, I can't get that knife and I want that knife so bad? First of all, I would never get a knife called the Bushmaster. Thank you. I thought it wasn't the Bushmaster. All right. What was the knife then? It's called Bushcraft. It's a Bushcraft knife, but it's Jack Lore. Jack, Jack Lore. L-O-R-E. He is the number one. You cannot get it. You have to wait years to fucking do it. He makes them, puts them on his website. And then first come, first serve, and that's it. He does not, you can't call him, you can't give him money. He makes, that's it. You get one. Jack. You never Lord. know when they're coming on the website. When he's down with them, he puts them on, they're gone. Oh, shit. All right. Jack Lord. Just, just sold one uh, in 2005, this year, just uh, two months ago. It, who, what, who did? Jack Lore just sold there, one. There's a there's a on the Jack Lore website. It's JackLore.com. They just lay. They sold one knife in September to two twenty. It, it's the ultimate bushcraft knife. It's the you you know, you can't get him like that. He's he makes them from scratch. One dude and and he puts them up like in like four in the morning because he's in England. Wow. And, you can't get one. You can buy a secondhand one once in a while because I'm a member of the Jack Lore Facebook page. You have to join it. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking oh, great. You degenerate. <laughs> <laughs> but can't. I want one from him. You understand? Yeah. You want? I, I. I literally. I this year on the way to Aruba in December. I went on the page. I go on the page in the morning. And it said the website was his, his email appears, just appears out of nowhere sometimes. And when it appears, you send him an email, I want the knife. I was second in line. 
He goes, somebody else is first. If he doesn't take it, you're next. Oh. I, go, I go, please, I would love to get this knife. And I left this long, uncomfortable message to him how much I love his knife. He never responded. <laughs> uh, what's the price point? Yeah, how much did it cost, Bobby? Well, that's the thing, too, is I think they're around 700 Oh, well, in the world of knives, that's very reasonable. Very reasonable, yeah. He's very reasonable, but, but I have five knockoff Jack Lures. Like, you can buy knives like that. I, I have around five Bushcraft knives, but to, the way he makes it, the steel he uses... And the precision in everything that he does. If you get one of these knives, he's and he he's an old guy. The, the, these knives will be like a fucking Rolex. You oh. know? In in uh. you know, in ten years, if you have a Jack Lord knife, you're gonna fucking have like, you know. You're you talking know. to obsessive compulsive. Yeah, yeah, Bobby. You have no idea. Me and Joel both have the same Tanzanian sword. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, if you get a Jack Lord knife before me. I will fucking stab you. you. Stab him. I will fucking hate you. <laughs> you understand that? Yeah. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying, though. If you get a if some if the Burt bus somehow does an English tour, and I see a fucking an episode on YouTube where you're hey and you're just hanging out with Jack at his fucking thing, and he makes you a custom Burt fucking Jack Lore knife. Yeah. I will fucking attack you. Well, you know what? You know what Joel and I are doing? Joel and I want to go to Spider Co. in Golden, Colorado and see if they'll let us design our own knives. Uh, that, I mean, that's fucking amazing. I love Spider Co. They're great knives. Great knives. But dude, a, a fucking bushcraft knife is, is a different... A bushcraft knife, if you have a jack little <laughs> bushcraft knife, when the, when the shit goes down, you can, you can make a house... You can make chairs, tables. You can literally survive in the wilderness. <laughs> it's a magic wand. With a spider co, you'll be able to field dress a deer and maybe fucking whittle some wood and cut some rope. Okay. Uh, I just like how if you're lost in, like, during the apocalypse, the first thing you're thinking of is a chair and table. <laughs> Bobby! <laughs> when you, let me tell you something. I don't know if you've ever been out in the woods for a couple of days. What are you going to do? Put your deer meat on the dirt? <laughs> Yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> ahead, you're gonna want a little table. Uh, that's that's bush crafting. You're taking the bush and crafting it. Uh-huh. And I know how to make a chair. I know how to make a table. I know how to make a, a shelter. And you know, you want to, and all that shit. You you can you only can do with this type of knife. I love your passion for this knife, Bobby. I, I want listen to me. I want this knife. Aggressive. It's been three years. Three years. <laughs> three years. And all right, I, is that the challenge? I guess now Bert and I are going to try to get in two. Yep, we're we're all going for Jack Lord Bushcraft knives now, Bobby. <laughs> you just increased the marketplace by a thousand. You got a you got a hundred thousand people listening to this podcast going. Now I need a Bushcraft knife. I'm signing up the Facebook page. <laughs> listen, dude, if you get a Jack Lord before me, I will listen. I will reason. I'll still love you in public, and then when we see each other, what's up, buddy? Know that I will have a resentment against you. <laughs> For the rest of the fucking the rest of our time, Bert. If you get one for him, I'm going to uh, commission a custom leather belt that goes across your chest and goes and just there's a sheath right just oh yeah right in the middle so you can pull it out just like that and so a- anywhere you are you will see the knife on you. You have to wear it. You'll wear it on the outside. And if you can invite Mr. Kelly over. It'll be great. <laughs> Listen, man. If you get a fucking Jack Lore, you better get two. That's all I'm telling you. Okay. Hey, do you want to wish me happy birthday, Bobby? You know what, dude? I was going to uh, text you a message because I saw it was your birthday. How, happy birthday, buddy. How old are you now? 46? 40, 48, Bobby. Are you 48? Yeah, 48. Lance 50, so whatever. I'm 50. You're 50? I'm 50. 50. That's no. so fucked up. You just did that. Like, yeah, but I, I fuck a 50-year-old, Bobby. Uh, <laughs> Who are you gonna say like that for? What the fuck, dude? Jesus Christ! Isn't that funny? Doesn't it seem like fucking two years ago having sex with a fifth year old was like kind of a fantasy? Yeah, now, now it seems like a fucking very big reality. <laughs> um, yeah, dude, happy birthday! Dude. Thank you, dude, brother. I'm so happy for you. What are you doing today? Are you doing anything fun? I'm cooking a brisket and then finishing up a podcast with Joel, and then uh, cooking a brisket and then getting drunk and getting on my treadmill. 
Fucking perfect, buddy. Hey, will you do my less titty challenge with me next month? Yes, I will. Fucking, I love you so much. Have right, a great love you day. too. Go take it easy, buddy. All right, I'll see you at the uh, Jack Lore episode in London. <laughs> uh, uh, that's great because if you do one, know that you'll be stabbed by a uh, a fake Jack Lore. <laughs> oh. <laughs> a terrible oh. death. All right, brother. I'll talk to you later. Bye, buddy. Take Bye. care. Which hey, what? What else? Which treadmill do you have? Uh oh, I John, I went all out, all out, all out. This was my birthday present last year, and it's the best thing I ever got because I've run uh 850 miles on it this year. Wow. Um, it's a it's a Woodway. Wow. It was, all right. It's a it's an industrial treadmill, so it's meant for gyms. But I wanted the one that I that I wanted a treadmill that got me excited to get on the treadmill that got me that that I never got on and was like. Ugh. I wanted something that pumped me up and they brought, they brought a, like a showroom on the back of a flatbed truck to my house. Um, I ran on all the different ones. I ran, I tried everything they had and I said, I want this one. And they just pulled it off, put it in and it was super expensive. And it was my birthday present last year. And it's the greatest present I got, especially in a pandemic. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm that's- actually, are you going to start drinking again soon? Oh no. That, it was just that January. Cause I knew if I started drinking, on your episode, then my me taking a month off is that's like the first time in a decades. So I was like, I can't, I have, I have to not drink, and so uh, I didn't. And oh, you did uh, great. Uh, it was probably better because I would have just probably I don't know, I would have, but uh, but no, I that I, I haven't done it since. <laughs> I was going to be like a sober October before that. I was like, eh, never mind. So. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, so somehow I got through that. It was probably, I, I, I and I was kind of like, it'd be super fun to drink with them. And then I was like, it's going to be strangely more interesting for me not to be, you know, slightly buzzed here. And then, you know, to watch Miss Pat and <laughs> Kelly. And by the way, sipping tea was the thing to do that day, oddly oh. enough. <laughs> oh my gosh. that was well, Listen, we're putting in a new podcast studio and, uh, and I would love to have you over and have a cocktail and bullshit and, and oh, do another one of these. I'll do that in a heartbeat. I'd love that. I'd love that. Well, we should be, we, I think we're furnishing it next week. We'll be up and running in like December, January. So let's schedule something. And I'd love yeah. to have you ever have that. We'll get, we'll get some really nice whiskey and uh, have a drink and talk shit. Of, uh, I'll bring some, I'll bring you a knife. I know which knife I'll bring you. Oh, I'm, I can't wait to get that Jack lore. No, yeah, well, I, I get, I will be emailing that guy tonight. It's only, <laughs> now it's only because you're, Bob, Bob, Bob Kelly. He's just so mad all of, out of the gate. I'm like, oh, I'm getting this. Uh, uh, awesome, yeah. brother. Well, hey, thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing the cabin. And congrats on the podcast with Ken. Congrats well, on you. all the success on television. I see you on uh, The Masked Singer. I, I, I saw you on, what's the new one? The, the, I can see uh, your voice. I can see your voice. Car, everything you're doing, man. Everything you're doing. Yo, you really need to go on that show. You'd be so great. You'd love uh, I'm it. telling you. I'm, I'm, you know me. I'll do it in a heartbeat. Uh, and thank you for Andrew. Without Andrew Hobson, there would be no Ken in my pocket. He's Andrew Hobson is a lifesaver. He has been a lifesaver for me. I love him with all my heart. He's my cousin. For everyone that doesn't know, he tours with me when we're on the road. And I, I think he is absolutely the best. And he thinks so highly of you guys. It's insane. He's a badass. So yeah. no wonder you're the, at what you've done. You surrounded yourself with... Uh, is fucking pros who are super nice. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a I'll, well, off air. I'll tell you some funny Andrew stories of like how he tries to implement curfews on the bus at times. He's like, you know, Bert, I think it would really help if we just got a good night's sleep, went for a jog in the morning, maybe had like a fresh juice, go by Burger King, get one of those vegan whoppers. I think that's what we need to be doing. <laughs> that is so he's like, uh, he's like your parent on the bus. Oh, yeah. Oh, when we were talking about peptides, he was like, I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm not certain about these. I was like, they're not going in your body. They're going in my body. <laughs> okay. Do you take uh, creatine? No, I no, I should though. Yeah, that stuff works. I just okay. need something to repair my body from running. Because right now my body just, like after sitting this long, my thighs are locked up, my hips are locked up, and my back, lower back is locked up. And so you need just to- been deadlifts or stretching. But I, I used to have a really bad lower back and deadlifts saved my life. Oh, maybe I'll do some deadlifts today. Because the weakest part of your body, which for me was my lower back. So anytime you anything starts going bad, because your other muscles are strong, 
it goes to your lower back or to wherever you're, uh, uh, you know, not as strong. And so I was like, what am I going to do? My back's going out. And this little tiny trainer in New York just goes, I'm going to fix your back in a week. And I'm like, what? And she did. And All right, I'm doing deadlifts. I went from being able to deadlift only the bar, basically. I couldn't do much more than that, too. And now I can do like 400 pounds. Jesus. So, yeah, because I have to brag. I'm bragging right now. <laughs> well, hey, thank you for doing this, Joel. Thank I you for absolutely having me. Love you, man. You're the best. Uh, no, far I are Leanne's favorite. Uh, well, <laughs> the stories about her dad and the racing. I was just like, oh my gosh, she's yeah, she's you. You uh, you did very well. You did the you did what I did and married up. You 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 found somebody better. I did. We're going to do a live podcast in the new studio. I'm going to have Segura on and we're going to talk about Porsches and cars. And that's the next level. Great. I just ordered a new one. So <laughs> yeah. Turbo OS. Awesome, brother. Thank All you right. so much. I appreciate it. Joel. You. Say hello to your wife. I will. All right. All right. Take care. And thank you guys. That was so much fun. That was a blast.